Today's guest is an inventor, a researcher, a military intelligence veteran, an economist, an agriculturalist, systems developer, societal explorer, a cyclist, a hiker, an outdoorsman, and is the author of Destination North Pole, a 5,000 uh, 5, yeah, 5, meters by bicycle. And I'd like to introduce Gary Whitgriff. Oh, good afternoon. Thanks for hosting me today, Jeff. No problem. How are you doing today? Doing, doing great. A little, little cool out here, but uh, it's fall. We should get used to it. You know, I'm, I'm really excited to uh, have this conversation with you. And there's so many things that we can, we can talk about. You know, you have this new book. Um, you also have a couple other books that are very interesting that I want to get into. But the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, you're an inventor and you hold six patents. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I mean, that's very interesting. Yes, it's um, six patents. The, the first one was a design patent. I helped uh, develop and implement a, a bulk handling system for seeds. So was, that's my agriculturalist background. And automating the packaging and bulk delivery, I developed uh, a design patent. And then to make that work, I, I, I have uh, four engineering patents to go with that. And then uh, it was, was an issue until 2014, but obviously as an agronomist, I have uh, studied plants and my last patent took several years to implement because it's, it's fairly complex, but I basically convert a biomass to a liquid. Uh, we'll say take a cornfield and convert it to liquid in 24 to 72 hours. Wow. And, and pump it by pipeline. So that's the, the range of patents that I have. Holy cow. And so the research that you do, you said that you're uh, working with an institute in Turkey? Is that yes. Uh, for 20 years, I did uh, a month-long uh, tour of Turkey and was sponsored over there by Rotary International, in fact. And one of the visits we made was Uludag University. And of course, being the only agriculturalist on the program, they uh, asked me to uh, visit and tour their uh, newest agricultural college, which was Uludag University. And so did some plot tours. And, and uh, by the time we got into about an hour into the, into the tour, I was asked to uh, do a seminar for their grad students. And that seminar uh, uh, turned out to be, I, I had done some implementation work on uh, environmentally um, fragile ground, trying to minimize erosion and how to um, uh, eliminate tillage if possible and things like that. And so that led into a, a two hour seminar at Uludag University. And then uh, they asked for a copy of my two books at the time, which was on millet. Uh, millet had been historically grown in Turkey for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And so they uh, wanted that, read that, and that led into several years of, well, about uh, 15, 20 years of uh, joint research. I could obviously write a little better. They did excellent research work. I would often send seeds, whether it be Ford soybeans or millet or whatever, over to Turkey. They would, uh, they would plan it and uh, collect all the data, summarize the data. And then uh, uh, with my help, we would put it into a publishable paper. And so we're published internationally quite a few different topics. Very cool. So <clears throat> your background in agriculture, um, how did that influence, I guess, your observations on your, on your, uh, <clears throat> on, on your trip to the North Pole? <laughs> well, when you make a living in agriculture, you can't help but uh, uh, look at the scenery. And, sure. uh, you know, today I'm, I'm wearing earbuds so I, I can uh, hear you and, uh, uh, obviously be recorded a little bit better, but on the way to North Pole, I only tried earbuds one time and I wanted to try it in North Dakota because the storm was coming up and my battery was dead on my little uh, carry portable phone, portable phone or portable uh, radio. Mm -hmm. And so the next day I charged it and was going to listen to it again. And as you know, in the summer, spring, especially we have thunderstorms up here. And I, I found, I, this is crazy. I am avoiding nature to listen to electronic data. I'll look at the clouds, I'll feel the wind. And from there on, I did nothing with no radio, no earbuds, no music, only listen to what was surrounding me. 
Sure. Sure. Being from South Dakota, you're kind of used to that though. I mean, I remember uh, I grew up there and sure. uh, you know, when you go out and you'd uh, you'd see the storms rolling in, you know, you'd yep. see the roll of clouds or, you know, you'd yep. be able to tell by the wind, whether or not you're having uh, just a normal storm or if there's a tornado right around the corner, you know, that <laughs> that's right. into a field. You better figure it out quick. You, you have to figure it out quick, especially when you're farming, because you got to pull all the equipment in and, and make sure everything's safe and try and get as many animals as you can to, uh, to safety. But uh, yeah. I almost got killed by lightning uh, doing that. We thought we had a chance, me and my brother, a chance for one more round when we were out bailing and lightning struck in front of the tractor and it <laughs> off, went straight up in the air. And I don't know if it was smoke or dust or whatever, but it was uh, terribly frightening. And so uh, when I'm bicycling over 40 days to North Pole, Alaska, I better pay attention to the weather. Yep, absolutely. And the bears, I was looking at uh, some of the pictures that you had and it was amazing. <laughs> You know, the, there's a, there's a particular picture on, I think it's on the front of the, where you have a bison and a bear and there's black yeah. bears and grizzly bears. And I mean, you're just, you're just biking at about an average of 10 miles an hour and, right. oh, look, there's a bear. It's uh, bears, uh, black bears and grizzlies. I literally seen hundreds of them uh, as you get up into uh, uh, Northern British Columbia and the Yukon, Alaska, uh, hundreds of them. But uh, they're, they're dangerous. I tried to read up before I left, obviously, how to react to them, but uh, you can't outrun them on a bicycle. They, they move from 35 to 55 miles an hour, depending on if it's grizzly, they move faster. There's no way you're going to outbike them. So you right. have to figure out how to uh, avoid them and not attract attention, although a bicyclist attracts more attention than a car does because they're used to cars right. uh, going down the road. And in, in the, the ditch, they're in the brush or whatever, and they're mostly grazing dandelions. And when they see or hear or smell a bicyclist coming, they become alert. So they're very interested in you. Did you have any close calls or anything that kind of sent a chill down your spine? There's hundreds and hundreds of things that I had to avoid. Uh, besides uh, bears and grizzlies, yes. There, there were, I tried to tell the funny stories because the, the dangerous stories are ones that um, may tweak a reader for a little bit. I have uh, video clips, for example, in my YouTube video, Destination North Pole, my grand nephew took my wife and my uh, photos and video clips and put them into a uh, like nine, 10 minute video. And so in there, I used my, uh, my iPhone to do all the recording and mm -hmm. so you'll pick out some of the, the background and the actions of the, of the, the bear. But when you're bicycling, it is far more than, than bears I had to worry about. Inattentive drivers was probably my biggest concern oh. when I left. And uh, as was my friends and family saying, you're going to get killed. Just, you know, drivers. And, and so because I told you earlier, I, I was in military intelligence. And so I um, made a living for years, uh, four years uh, active duty, listening to uh, recordings. And so um, trying to differentiate the different radio signals. And so that's what I did on the way up there, trying to differentiate the different sounds in nature. But as far as vehicles go, I uh, would try to guess if they were a camper pulling, you know, a truck pulling camper or an RV or a motorcyclist or a car or just a standard pickup or was a semi pulling a load. And mm -hmm. then when they went by, it would, it would, it would, uh, uh, obviously, I would confirm my, my guess. But the reason I did that early on was to protect myself, in, unconsciously protect myself, because if I started hearing rumble strips, especially rumble uh, cars, tires hitting rumble strips close behind me, I had to have a, a, an evasion plan. Exactly. Which is dive into the ditch where the bear is, right? <laughs> where it could be a bear. <laughs> uh, as my nephew, uh, the book is Destination North Pole. And why destination North Pole? I wanted to bike to Alaska for about six, seven years, and uh, I, I needed a destination. So my uh, nephew, niece, and their three girls lived in North Pole, Alaska. So I go, okay, destination North Pole it is. So I bike from Pierce, South Dakota to North Pole, Alaska. It's a, it's a very important um, <clears throat> thing when you live in South Dakota that you pronounce Pierre right. It is not Pierre. <laughs> right. It is Pierre. 
we say peer to the poll. And that was my blog, 40, 40 days of blogging. I did peer to the poll and I didn't, wasn't on social media at the time. And so I, uh, my friends and family said, we want to know where you're at. And I wasn't about to, you know, email them because what limited internet there was, I decided to do a, uh, do a nightly blog when I had internet. And uh, even if I didn't, I did the blog and saved it and, and published right. it when I did have internet. But uh, my, my blog was peer to the poll. And uh, while I was biking, I had uh, told some friends, uh, uh, French, French speaking Canadian friends uh, about, about it and they were wanting to track me. They were in Paris at, or uh, in France, but Paris in particular at the time. And uh, the wife looked at the husband and says, why did Gary change his name to Pierre? <laughs> Pierre to the poll. I go, oh, I haven't changed my name. <laughs> I'm Gary. We pronounce it Pierre. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, <clears throat> so on your trip, you know, you, you, you saw a lot of beautiful things. Is there anything that stuck out as, you know, just something that was so amazing that you weren't expecting or, or was it all just so beautiful that, uh, that, that there isn't anything that just sticks out in your mind as the most beautiful thing you ever saw? I'm from South Dakota. And, and as you know, we have a range of uh, cornfields in the east and, and mountains and, and uh, woods in the west and, and rivers in between. There is so much to see on that 3,000 mile trip. Uh, most of it was in Canada, so that's why I called it 5,000 kilometers by bicycle. Right. But it is just uh, astounding what you see. Earlier, you asked me about the dangers of bears. But as my, as my nephew said, more people get injured and killed by moose in Alaska than bears. And so watch out for moose one day. Speaking of beauty, but danger, I was biking along. This is up in the Yukon and a moose came out of the woods. And up there, they don't uh, trim the, the roadsides as much as they do farther uh, uh, south into British Columbia and mm -hmm. uh, especially Alberta, Saskatchewan. And so the brush can get fairly close to the road. And this moose came out and behind her, she came up on the shoulder of the road right towards me, uh, about uh, 50 to 70 yards out and kept walking towards me as, as her calf came out of the brush. And I go, oh my God, you know, hmm. baby calf. I had never seen a moose calf. Uh, a teeny, teeny, it was smaller than a cow calf. And really? it come up on the shoulder and this moose stopped waiting for the, the calf to catch up. And she looks at me strangely and I go, what do I do? I, I you know, being around cattle uh, on the farm, uh, my early life, we, we raised cattle and cows can be very dangerous, especially with calves. And so I go, okay, just mentally, I, I basically froze, put the bike in front of me and I tried not to be frightening to her. And she's a beautiful animal. I could have biked underneath her. I mean, they have extremely tall legs yeah. and I could have ducked and biked underneath her, but the calf caught up with her. She looked at me for a little bit. I don't know how good their seeing is or their, their sight is, but she then uh, walks across the road, the calf follows her, she goes in the brush on the other side. But uh, those are the kinds of things that are scary, but uh, the experience is just beautiful. It's just uh, phenomenal. The uh, the thing that comes to mind is if you uh, go to YouTube and uh, you uh, um, just search uh, moose attacks, there are, I mean, they are territorial. They are, they're scary. I mean, they're dangerous. They're, they they're a dangerous animal. And, and as I point out in the book, Destination North Pole, uh, moose uh, could, uh, would, would, one would think that a big, strong, tall animal like that would have been a beast of burden. But because of their unpredictable temperament, I think they never were domesticated. And so the caribou and other animals were domesticated, but in North America, there was no beast of burden. Uh, buffalo, for example, the same way. They can be very unpredictable, yeah. but are massive animals, but were not domesticated because you can't trust them. Right. And by the way, by the way, there were hundreds, literally hundreds of wood bison in uh, Northern BC. They graze the ditches early in the morning. And when it gets warm, especially, you know, I bike from May 20th to June 30th, uh, that time of the year when it gets warm, uh, they go into shading, go into the, the bush, they call it, the trees and the brush sure. for uh, uh, cooler. But in the early mornings, I left it a lot of times by five in the morning 
and uh, the wood bison would be grazing the ditch, uh, two, five, six to a herd, as many as 50 to a herd. And it, it's, it's scary because uh, they, uh, the, the bulls tend to protect the herd. And so as the cows and calves move ahead, uh, they see me and hear me, whatever, they move ahead and the bulls turn around and face me. Yep. And uh, one time I screeched my, my front and back brake because I had to stop in a hurry. And I realized it was a screeching in my front brake that scared them. <laughs> and so after that, every time I, I faced a, a bison, you know, standing, looking, turning towards me or whatever, I, I had to avoid them. And I used my front screeching brake to scare them. Yep. Bison will charge you for no reason, or at least no reason that you know of. And moose will do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't have any experience with moose, but uh, bison and cows, I mean, for no other reason, all of a sudden, you know, you hear it and you turn around like, oh boy. <laughs> if you, you mentioned YouTube uh, and obviously Destination North Pole, I have some video clips of bison. The front page of my book shows a wood bison yep. on there. And, and that's not the picture that I took. It, it actually, uh, it was a bison on the side of the road, just like that, a little bit farther down from where I actually took that front page picture. And uh, it was too blurry because it got up and started running beside me. And so my photos, iPhone photos of this, this bison were, I mean, dust, tail straight out and dust lying behind him. Well, that's not a good picture for the front covers. They need something a little clearer. And so my friend that did the cover put a, put a different wood bison on there. But uh, they were, them were real pictures that I, I put on the cover and have in the video, uh, YouTube video. Cool. So do you have a YouTube channel? Uh, yes, but the only thing I posted it was the, the two-minute clip of okay. uh, Destination North Pole and the, the nine to ten-minute uh, clip, but uh, it's well worth watching. And then there are other things of people interviewing me and things like that on the, on YouTube under my last name. What I thought about, I, I watched that nine, uh, ten-minute clip or whatever okay. that Good. you had, and what I thought was funny was how friendly the people were. So you had a, a story where a gentleman actually invited you, you looked tired. And uh, invited you to stay in his camper for a couple of days in the middle I, of nowhere. Uh, well, it was in the middle of Alberta, so it's not in the middle of nowhere. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, once you get up into the Yukon, that's nowhere. That's nowhere. I mean, okay, there, there, there is uh, you know uh, twelve fifteen hundred miles of of uh, hardly anybody. <laughs> I mean, it's fair. But in this case, I was I got up early in the morning, which I, I usually did. And I had biked for about an hour and a half. And I uh, come to this little town in Alberta. And the guy, I think it was Western Saskatchewan or Alberta. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the gas station was just opening. And so I go, oh, wow, they got a gas pump. And so I go in this, this 1950s, 60s type of gas station, which is now has a microwave oven and a freezer. So I grabbed <laughs> some uh, two breakfast sandwiches and popped it in the microwave, went on the gas pump to eat. This guy pulls in with his pickup and still in the pickup. And, he looks at me and goes, ah, you look, uh, look kind of beat. And I go, well, I, I've been biking for an hour and a half. He goes, well, I got a camper over there. You stay a few days if you want to. <laughs> and so they were the kind of friendly people you run into. It's just phenomenal because you're moving at 10 to 10 and a half miles an hour. Cars zooming by you at 60 miles an hour. That guy would never have asked, uh, you know, someone driving a vehicle. But he asked nope. me. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. You know, and it's it's those type of people that make that. I mean, it, it was a treacherous journey. I mean, you are, you know, very skilled to have made that without too many, without any injuries or anything like that. I mean, that's there. There's a lot of dangers on the way, but I mean, it's also a very beautiful and and uh, and worthwhile trip. But uh, not many people do what you did. Well, I'd originally writ written this book as a travel log. From, uh, for a bicyclist that wanted to take a trip that nobody was taken. And uh, there's lots of books about uh, biking in Europe or biking across the U.S. or biking the Appalachian Trail or whatever, uh, but no book from uh, South Dakota to uh, central, North Central Alaska and you know, off to the Arctic Circle. And yep. so I wrote it as a, a bicycle travel guide. But this spring, because of the, the worldwide pandemic, my wife and I isolated in the Black Hills for uh, three months. And that's where I finished the book and I changed it into a armchair adventure. So anybody that is unable to travel, even if they're able to travel, can uh, read an exciting travel venture, uh, the dangers, the beauty, the 
unusual ha uh, happenstances that you run across uh, without leaving their armchair. And so uh, to give me an example, give me an example. I, uh, our bookstore shut down and permanently, unfortunately here in Pierre. Oh, geez. And, uh, but the bike store was booming. And I went over and talked to Tom because he had helped me out on some things before, uh, before I took off and said, Tom, would, could I have a book signing over here? He goes, yeah, yeah. In fact, I want to buy some. And, and he agreed to have a display. So I had a book signing. Uh, one lady come in, she was 80 and had heard uh, about my, my trip and wanted to buy the book. So she comes in the afternoon, buys the book. A couple of weeks later, I see her and she, and she had never been on a bike in her life. She goes, I read that the same night. This is a good book. So <laughs> that was to me a great testimonial that you don't have to be a bicyclist or a, a long distance traveler to enjoy this book. I, I just, you know, knowing the uh, South Dakota terrain, the one thing I got a real kick out of was uh, you have some questions in the front of the book, you know, kind of a, kind of a Q and a type thing. And my favorite question in there was, was there wind? It's like, if you've never been to South Dakota, you know, one of my running jokes when I moved here from uh, South Dakota into Wisconsin is that I had to, it took me about two years to learn how to walk upright straight <laughs> because otherwise I was leaning this way to counteract the wind. You yeah, know, nice 30 mile an hour breeze. So that had to be a, a tough thing to contend with as far as biking that far. Okay. Whenever somebody bikes, wind is an issue. I, I don't care. Wind and hills are, are issues. That just goes with bicycling. And so mentally, if you're going to bike 3,000 miles, 5,000 kilometers, you have to be prepared. There's going to be wind, whether it be in the Dakotas, uh, Saskatchewan, flat, 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 Alberta, flat, flat, flat. And the mountains, because coming through some of those passes, there's wind. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you just mentally get uh, uh, get adapted to it, I guess. One of the things I thought was another thing about your video, which I thought was really funny. Uh, not funny, but, uh, you know, look at it and you're, you're taking a picture of a sign with a 10% grade and you're going down the hill. It's like, oh boy, on a bike. Yeah. I hope you're that was a good one. That was, <laughs> that was the easy part. It's coming up the other side. Yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, so bicyclists, you, uh, you have those kind of things. But what I did in the book after my first or second or 10th draft, I can't remember, I, uh, it was probably about the fourth draft, I pulled out those kinds of things because people don't want to hear all the struggles. It's not, I do, I throw a couple of them in there, yes. But this is a, this is a fun book. It was a fun ride. Mm -hmm. I don't want to bore people with, with the struggles. And I... I, I hadn't been on my bike in eight months. Uh, I had hiked in uh, quite a bit of Mexico and, and been in pretty good shape my whole life. But I have, uh, as we talked earlier, I was a wrestler, uh, but I've never uh, thought of myself as a you know, phenomenal athlete. My wife and I had biked uh, some long distances one time, uh, 478 miles in six days with a, with a, a big group, organized group, mm -hmm. Tour de Grota was, was fine. And so when I come back, I come back, I think it was on a Wednesday, I took off on a Sunday. I only biked 4.4 miles to calibrate my Walmart odometer and my um, uh, GPS I had got from uh, Amazon the, the, you know, the day before I took off. So 4.4 miles hadn't been on my bike in eight months and I take off wanting to bike to Alaska. And um, was, I, was I fit for it? I just decided I'm gonna bike uh, 50 to 60 miles, uh, 70 to 100 kilometers a day to start with, just to see, you know, how it's going. I had all day. Mm -hmm. uh, what? So that brings that, up. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. How'd that go? I mean, that that first day was that was that really rough on you, or the second day, did you notice a uh, little soreness or anything like that, or did you not really have that problem? Well, I took off. I, I turned 65. That's the reason I decided to schedule my. Uh, <laughs> My uh, bike ride when I did, you, you get to a certain age, you have some things you want to do. And that's one of them that uh, I thought the clock was ticking, it's time to go. Mm -hmm. And so uh, do, do you get sore? Sure you get sore. Is it, was it a problem? No. I, um, I left on May 20th thinking it was going to take me two months. I won the longest day of the year, uh, longest months of the year, meaning the longest days. So May 20th to July 20th, I had reservations in Fairbanks, Alaska on July 20th and uh, ended up uh, making it in 40 days. So I was three weeks early. 
but the, the goal was to bike every day to a clean bed and uh, uh, obviously find some food. And so I uh, figured, well, I don't know how, how I'm going to go, but I, it, I'll just bike until I find uh, a clean bed. And I made the first reservations, you know, uh, for, for city uh, up here by Gettysburg and then Shelby and uh, uh, rugby, North Dakota, Bismarck, uh, all the way up to Mayanata, you know, mobiles on up into Canada. So the first few days I, I thought I can make it to those places. And if it took me until nine o'clock at night, I would bike until nine o'clock at night. I think it's funny. You mentioned Minot. I always referred to that as the dark side of the moon. Well, it, it, it it's that way in your book <laughs> or your books. I know you have some interesting, interesting books. I have not had the opportunity to read them. No, yet, I just, they're, they're thrillers. Gr growing up, I, uh, I, I've been in Minot quite a few times and, uh, yeah. you know, the rocky terrain up there and, you know, especially with the oil booms and stuff that had happened up there. I just always kind of, you know, I never thought it was real great land, but they do an awful lot up there. Oh, it's amazing. As far as energy, uh, North Dakota, uh, obviously they have sun. As we talked earlier, they certainly have wind, uh, they have oil, they have coal, they have uh, uh, ethanol uh, mm -hmm. out of uh, uh, corn, and corn has moved into North Dakota big time. Uh, and so it is just a, a phenomenal country. And so as, you, as we talked earlier, we have uh, main highways. I biked on highways all the way up there, and I picked my route based on the easiest. Well, the easiest a lot of times was not the route where it had the oil trucks because some of them loads that they carry are wide and yeah. a bicycle has no chance. A bicyclist has no chance when uh, something is 14 foot wide and uh, taking the shoulder. So uh, I obviously had to watch out for those, um, especially in the oil fields. And that's not only North Dakota, it, it's uh, Saskatchewan now produces Alberta in oil. Yeah. By the way, you mentioned earlier about winds. Uh, I wanted to point out that uh, the wind in the Dakotas is primarily from the northwest, northwest. I biked west, northwest. That's true. Winds, the winds in uh, uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta are primarily west. And how I found that, I was in the Air Force and in the Air National Guard, in fact, for three and a half years. I, I briefed and debriefed pilots, and then later on, I was on the South Dakota Board of Aviation. Aviation Board of Directors. But uh, the way I determined when is looking at airport runways. Runways run primarily into the wind. And right. so the planes land into the wind and, and take off into the wind. And so to uh, reduce ground speed or speed uh, airspeed when you're taking off. And so it was fairly easy to track wind direction uh, on my planning uh, by seeing which way the runways were. And they were basically all east to west in the, in the Canadian prairie, prairie hmm. provinces. That's interesting. I was going to actually jump to a little different question. Sure. On your recording, you say, one day I woke up and told my wife, hey, I want to take a bike ride. How'd that go? Well, <laughs> my, wife, my wife, as I mentioned earlier, we had, we had done a, a fairly long bicycle ride. And uh, obviously, our nephew and niece and grandnieces live up in the North Pole, Alaska. I go, well, uh, they're not having True Dakota this year. You want to bike to uh, uh, North Pole? You want to bike to Alaska? Uh, she decided that over the years, uh, by the time I turned 65, she goes, uh, how about I drive? And she <laughs> stayed back for Memorial Day and uh, put her bike. We had her bike mounted on the back. So I took off on May 20th. Uh, she on... Uh, it took off on Memorial Day because she stayed back for a family situation mm -hmm. and uh, caught up with me in Western Saskatchewan. And so I, I left fully loaded with uh, me and the bike was uh, in pounds, was 285 pounds. And yeah. so I had a pretty good load on two little tires and it's a hybrid bike. It was a 10 year old bike. I wasn't going to buy a new bike. I right. used to the old one. So uh, my wife says, uh, no, I'm not going long, but I'll tell you what, we made a wonderful trip. She drove the 3,000 miles on her own, in her vehicle, left when she wanted, uh, stopped when she wanted, uh, uh, toured, uh, did hikes, uh, visited shops when she wanted. So it was her adventure as well as mine. Oh, cool. Is that notated in the, uh, in the book also? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, in certain ways, uh, well, in fact, I started out, I think, the first line describing it's endearing. Endearing because it was me and my wife on the trip. 
it's something couples can take, whether one bikes or they both bike off and on, or uh, one drives an RV and pull a camper or whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. It's a way of, of uh, adventuring out there. And that allows people to place themselves, whether you be a man or woman, husband or wife, place yourselves into the ride and thinking about how you would have reacted or what you would have taken your wife if you were driving the car that day and she was biking. So it was, it's a wonderful, endearing trip for both of us. Hmm. Cool. I, um, <clears throat> as I'm, as I'm kind of thinking about how that trip probably manifested and all the planning that you had to do, I mean, when did, when did you first approach your wife with this, with this idea and how long did it take you to actually plan the trip out, get everything together? And, and what was, what was the preparation like? Uh, I was working uh, back in 2010 when we took uh, five days off work. I took a week off work to bike the Tour de Dakota, 478 miles in, in five, six days, six days. And my wife uh, went along with me. And, and uh, when I read that winter that uh, they were not longer having that, I go, now I'm going to uh, bike a long uh, ride like one of the guys we had met on that tour. He said that we were having breakfast one of those days, and he said he had he him and his brothers biked to Alaska. That was his most exciting trip. And I go, wow, that's what I want to do. Well, the next year, I had asked my bosses to take off work, and I, I say, I'm going to bike to Alaska. And so I was, you know, all winter, and made copies of uh, maps and different things, different routes, and I was ready to go. And they go, yeah, Gary, I think you uh, should stay and work. And I like the paycheck, so I, uh, I, I didn't go. <laughs> Well, uh, retired the next year, 2012, and for uh, six years, we traveled all over the world, uh, lots of countries, uh, all over the U.S. and RV mm -hmm. uh, for two summers, I should say. I uh, had been into Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, um, South America, and Europe, whatever. And so um, I decided when I turned 65, I had just released my other two books, and uh, in February, I had a book tour, finished those up, and go now is the time I'm going to go, you know, uh, you're going to go with me. No, I'm not going to with me. Okay. Let's pack the car. And so we came back from Mexico on a Wednesday. I left on Sunday. I, I bought supplies and uh, calibrated my odometers and took off hmm. using, using primarily the, the book I'd done earlier and uh, the maps I'd put together earlier, which I carried with me, did a little spreadsheet to track the data sure. and uh, 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 reserved rooms for the first uh, five days. I think it was. Wow. So you knew where you're going to be the first five days, but then going forward, you really had no idea how, how much, how far you would go that. And so it really became, you know, trying to find the next place to stop. I'm right. Right. And of course in, in the planning, I had uh, projected out uh, different options. If I make it 50 kilometers uh, this day, or if I make it a hundred or 200. So I, I looked where I might stay and where I might get food. I, I would like a hot meal if I could get it. I carried three cans of Spam. I didn't need them all. I, you know, and packages of uh, uh, tuna and things like that to give me peanut butter sandwiches and things like that to give me energy. But I, I biked to a, to a clean bed. And as you know, in the Dakotas, uh, certainly in Saskatchewan and Alberta, there are long stretches between lodging and uh, so I had alternatives. My shortest day was only 15 miles. My longest day in Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan was uh, 166 miles, 267 kilometers. Sure. And so uh, did I have some long days? Sure. Did I have some short days? Absolutely. I averaged 75 miles a day, 121 kilometers a day. Yeah, that is cool. So in your mind, you know, your book shows all the fun stuff. You know, you know, I saw it is, this it is a fun book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's the one thing that out of your book that you think somebody would be astounded at? Like, like, oh my God, I can't believe that that actually exists or, you know, something that would be, <clears throat> would, would, would set somebody back and say, okay, I need to take this trip. What's the one thing that would, that would be? Well, I try to, I'm going to hold this up. I don't know if you can see the front front cover. Yep. Anybody looking at the front cover is saying there's a, there's a lot of things on there, a lot of dangerous things on there. And obviously you see my bicycle shadow. Mm -hmm. I took this. Uh, in fact, the mountains in the background uh, were uh, the Yukon. So I was in Northern British Columbia heading into the Yukon. And so I seen this sign. It says 75 kilometers to steamboat. 
there was no services in Steamboat that I could find in my book. And it says uh, 520 kilometers to Watson Lake. I go, <laughs> that's quite a ways. <laughs> I go, I had a bike already an hour and a half that morning. I go, I, I, I got to I want a clean bed tonight. I, I carried a little bivy. I call it a bivy bag. It's just an emergency sleeping bag to keep the yeah. mosquitoes and, and bugs out and, and keep me warm if I had to sleep on the side of the road. But uh, to answer your question directly, just, you know, uh, not the, the, the things on the front of the book. My most unusual story, and of course, I, I tell about this in my blogs. My blogs start each chapter. But one day I was biking along and I decided that day my blog was going to be about the bear that crossed right in front of me. I'm mm -hmm. just a couple of blocks in front. He went across the road. He was uh, head down sniffing something. And I go, wow, I avoided him. Within 20 minutes, certainly within a half hour, I don't know if I felt or heard or, or seen something out of the corner of my eye, but I glance over and I'm eyeball to eyeball with a crane. It turned out to be, a, I found out later, it was a sandhill crane, but it looks at me. And I go, this is crazy. It was drafting me. And so I slowed to a stop and it flies in the ditch in front of me and squawks. It walks into the brush and the brush there is uh, uh, three, four, five foot tall. So mm -hmm. say two to three meters tall. And every once in a while, it would stick its head out. I stopped and I ate my peanut butter sandwich, I ate another peanut butter sandwich. And I'm looking at this thing. This is just crazy. I took pictures, but I could, in my pictures, I could never find the head of the crane. But you can't make this stuff up. And that's really when I decided this, I'm going to write a book because these things just don't happen. Right. Drafted by a crane. I don't know if she was a female and like my bright yellow jersey or what, but uh, I, I, was, I was drafted by a crane. That's cool. That is so cool. So and that book is available on Google <clears throat> or Google Books, uh, Apple Books, uh, Kindle. <clears throat> uh, Absolutely. Kindle, Bar Barnes and Noble, uh, Barnes and on Noble. ebooks. Uh, I also uh, have it out in hardcover and in paperback. Are and you so, on? Are you on Kobo? Uh, yes, you can get it on Kobo. I have a New York distributor. Okay. And so uh, my New York distributor uh, supplies Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and Indie Books, and and all of, all the libraries, bookstores uh, worldwide. And so uh, I, uh, I my website uh, relating to ancients.com. You can, you can order it there, but I would say it's much quicker if you, because we travel a lot, uh, go to bookch.com or call them, but uh, sure. bookch.com is my New York distributor. Okay. So you mentioned your, your website relating to agents.com yes. and you have two other books out. Well, uh, yes, I, I actually have, uh, well, I've written seven books, but uh, the last three in the last three years, uh, Culture and the Mysterious Agent Changing It, and learning as it influences the 21st century came out in 2018, uh, right right before I took off on my bicycle trip. And they seem very interesting. Um, can you kind of go into what your what your premise is for those books and, and uh, why you're why you're uh, you're researching how you created them? I guess. Well, I in the in the Air Force, I'd spent time overseas, and had traveled a fair amount. Uh, since my wife and I retired, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we have traveled a lot and in fact only traveled. We have not had a permanent apartment or a house uh, since 2012. We had uh, rented different places around the world. We had an RV for two summers that we parked in Arizona one year and Florida the next winter. Mm -hmm. Went to Australia. Our son was a doctor over there and so we went and visited him and stayed over there a few months. Next year, we did the same thing, went to New Zealand, North Island one year, the South Island another year, went to Fiji. Uh, our daughter uh, was sponsoring a girl in Guatemala, and so we went down there with her, uh, met her down there, and the girl she was sponsoring, the parents invited us to their place, and it was like, wow, this, they, they had no, it was Adobe, basically dirt stacked on top of dirt and yeah. uh, a rusty tin roof in order to keep the, the walls from washing away. I mean, no windows, no doors. They put up corn stalks to keep the, the walls from washing away. Oh, wow. And, and uh, we go, we got to build a house for these people. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my wife and I, uh, uh, through some uh, help of friends and family, we raised enough money to, to uh, build them a house. Now, granted, it's small. It was uh, maybe uh, 12 foot by 14 foot, something like that. Sure. Uh, it wasn't even that big. 
a 12, 11 by 13 probably. And so uh, we, we built them a, a house, uh, the father, mother, and the three, three kids, uh, these three daughters stayed in the same room. And so we stayed a month to make sure that house was finished. And that led to a lot of other projects, uh, helping people put in, uh, remove dirt floors and, and uh, smooth it out, put in concrete floors and uh, put roofs on and, and build uh, efficient stoves. Uh, we sponsored a girl in Uganda. So last year we went to Uganda and met her and, and she's an orphan girl living with her, with her uh, godparents or with her uh, paternal grandfather, I should say. Mm -hmm. in, a, in a little farming village where the only sustenance they get is from what they produce. There's no cars, there's no bicycle, there's no running water, or electricity. And so these are the things that give me background for culture and the mysterious agent changing it. It's just uh, learning about culture around the world and trying to answer the question, what changes culture? Okay. So what changes culture? Uh, you got to read my book. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's, it's a mystery. It's a, I, I treat it as a mystery. For decades, I, I've read books. Primarily, I read uh, nonfiction. I, uh, my wife was into refinishing antiques for years, and so we'd go to bookstores, I mean, go to uh, antique stores, and she would look for furniture that she could uh, refinish, and I would go through the old books. And so I read a lot of books from the late 1800s, early 1900s, and I go, these, you know, this is a transition from ancient times to modern times. Because when my grandfather was born in 1891, there was no, uh, certainly no car, automobiles. There was uh, no electronic communications, telephone, radio, TV. There was no immunizations. And so my grandfather, I use as the basis of old versus new, ancient versus non-ancient. And so for thousands of years, they did things this, pretty much the same way. And so my, my website is relating to ancients.com. And so uh, culture is a mystery. And I go, what is changing culture based on these old books and my experience in, in traveling 40 countries? What's changing culture? So the book is written as a riddle. So 20 of the 22 chapters start with a question, with, start with a riddle. And uh, you know, I try to answer those riddles as I go through the book and I do answer it. And so you have, you pick up the answers to the riddles as you read the book, <laughs> culture and the mysterious agent changing it. So <clears throat> you have the premise for culture and, and how it's changed. <clears throat> and then you have your riddles and, and you're answering those questions. And sure. then your next book is related, uh, relating to ancient learning. And as it influences the 21st century. Right. We're, right. So does that take it the next step where you start talking about education or, or what's that, what's that book doing? Okay. My series is relating to ancients.com and I'm going to have some other books in that series. So the first one is culture and the mysterious agent changing it. That led into the question that uh, so many, it doesn't matter what country you're in. They talk about how learning systems are changing for, for their students, whether it be our, our orphan girl in Uganda or Mexico, where they, they, actually start school at seven in the morning. And then that shift ends at uh, 1230, I think it is. Oh, it goes 730 to 1230, because we just talked to them a couple weeks ago. And then the next shift starts at one o'clock and they run till six. And so they use and, and change teachers and change students and everything using the same building. So different places use different learning systems. And with the COVID right now, they're actually using radio and television program. So if you're in the fifth grade, you tune in at a certain time to get your math lessons or okay. uh, radio or whatever, because they, they don't all have uh, Wi-Fi and access to computers. And so they use the technology that they have. That led really into my book, trying to answer the question of learning and how it's influencing the 21st century, using the past, observing the present, projecting the future. Okay. So that's kind of relatable to what we've been going through now since uh, since February and March, as right. far as the schools being shut down and and uh, yep exactly know, either homeschooling or uh, online schooling. Absolutely, kind of the same thing, just a little more technology involved over here. Yes, in fact, one of the things I write in culture as I transition because I wrote these two books the same at the same time. Uh, some fit more into the answering the learning question, some fit more into the answering the cultural question. 
But I, I wrote, fascination with technological gadgets has replaced intellectual pursuit. Mm -hmm. And so what is interesting, I find, uh, as I explore in the book, we're actually, and certainly I didn't predict the pandemic, but I certainly predict that we've transitioned to more efficient systems. What's more efficient, uh, transportation or electronics? Electronics. Right. So we're transitioning, we're going to transition to a digital learning system. It is, excuse me, it is unrealistic to expect that for the next 80 years in the 20th century, 21st century, we're going to transport kids in a bus to a square room and transport teachers there and teach things that the most efficient way of teaching. It's not going to happen. And so the pandemic transitioned to a more efficient system. It was there. People just weren't using it efficiently and we're still trying to figure out how to use it. So do you think that that's truly more, uh, I mean, obviously it's more efficient, but do you think that the learning actually happens the same way, whether you're online <clears throat> or doing it electronically versus doing an in-person lecture? Absolutely not. No, it, it absolutely is not the same way. You and I can visit. It's not the same as if we were shaking hands and, and uh, talking, but this means of communication is much more functional than it was when you started learning computers with punch cards as I did. And so uh, we have advanced our technology to a, I'll call it a 2D system, to a 3D, to a 4D system will be developed. And so we are using things that we didn't have access in the past. It will become more real. As I talk about in my book is we're going to travel virtually. As I write in Destination North Pole, we are virtually traveling with somebody else, in this case, by the first artificial memory system, and that's writing. You know, it's, it's 4,000 years old, but it's an artificial system. And now we use electronic artificial memory to record and to transmit and to interact. Right, but, you know, when you're traveling, I mean, you know, I'm going to read your book. Please. But there is no replacement for actually doing it yourself. I mean, there, I mean, you can be, you can, you can uh, write very eloquently on everything that you saw and your experiences and describe the smells and everything else, but actually yes. going and doing it, you know, so traveling virtually sounds, you know, fine. If you want to spend the afternoon doing it with, uh, with, uh, you know, like VR goggles or whatever we end up having. Yeah. Um, but realistically actually going out and, and experiencing nature is something that, that can't be replicated digitally right. or, or through writing. I 100% agree. And can it be replicated sitting in a square block room with a teacher standing in front? It's, it's different. That system was developed based on efficient transportation. The system we use right now is a 20th, mid to late 20th century education system. It's based strictly on efficient transportation. Before that, people mainly learned at home. And people get education and school and learning confused. And what our goal in uh, learning, the goal in school, is to develop people, children, into responsible, independent uh, adults that can support themselves and others in society. And so as I write in my book, Learning, I, I just pulled out the, the, the brochure on it. It sure. says, experience cannot be passed on. It must be learned. And so... Are you going to learn that for 20 years in a, in a, in a room? Nope. Not gonna learn all of it. You're nope. gonna learn way differently and bring in other experiences, whether you're on a bicycle biking to North Pole, Alaska, or whether you're in Uganda or Mexico or Guatemala or Australia or next door, you know, uh, bike down the street and, and bike to friends and you will get more experience than if you rode a school bus every day for 20 years, or we'll say 12 years to school. So, and I agree with you. Um, I think we're, we're saying the same thing. On your website, you know, as we talk about technology and how it's influencing education and, and how it's influencing society in general, uh -huh. um, you have a, a interesting recording about artificial intelligence and how that's, you know, I mean, basically the artificial intelligence and the recording of history and, and so on and so forth and how that's influencing 
uh, today's society. Can you, can you speak a little bit to that? I mean, what, do you, what are your opinions on that? Yeah, I've, I've done several uh, short audio video, video, or excuse me, audio recordings. And uh, one of them is ramifications. That's the latest one, ramifications of artificial intelligence. And uh, as I explore in the book, I mainly deal with electronic artificial memory, how we're using artificial memory to replace our memory. And I did an interview the other day, or a, a, a school teacher, another person interviewed me the other day. And uh, she mentioned that her, uh, she's now teaching first and second graders. Mm -hmm. And she said that uh, I asked him, what is five plus six? And one of the students wrote down 30. And she says, five plus six? That's what the calculator said. The reasoning wasn't there to figure out that the, the little cross was turned and it was a multiplication. Uh, uh, and so the, you have to get the fundamental concepts down in order to effectively use the electronic communications, in this case, electronic calculator. Now, I say in my books that learning has slowed. Technology is actually, school system, has actually slowed learning. And you go, how can that possibly be? A calculator is far more efficient. Yes, but five plus six is way faster just saying 11 than it is punching five, punching mm -hmm. times, punching six, punching equal. That's slowest. That's the same way with, with uh, keyboarding. Uh, we call it keyboarding now. We used to call it typewriter, learning to type. If that is not taught, how can you efficiently communicate? Because that is the way... You use your phone. That's the way you use your typewriter. That's the way, or, uh, excuse me, computer. That's what you use at work. And so unless you're extremely efficient on keyboarding, you can't be extremely efficient getting your thoughts down on paper. Well, <clears throat> yes, that's true. But if you look at the way uh, uh, people are texting now with all mm -hmm. the anacronyms and all the different uh, abbreviations and the, the emojis, which is, is kind of formulating its own language now, at least. Why are they doing that? I, because of simplicity. Ah, because they're trying to speed communication. Exactly. But it's changing right. the language. I mean, it's very, correct, it, it's correct. only the old people like us that actually, okay, I need a period <laughs> here. Okay. This is a comma whatever. Whereas my 20 year old daughter will just let it fly. And if it makes sense, great. And if it's spelled right, that's okay. You know, but if it's not no big deal, I mean, I read, I've read some of the stuff that she sent to her friends and it's like, Oh my God, I, I could have swore I taught you English at one point in time. Right. <clears throat> it, it is a big deal. If you don't understand the difference between a plus and a time sign. It is. It makes a difference. If somebody is drowning, I use this example in the book and you need a calculator to figure out how much rope to throw them. Uh, you know, you're, you need to throw a rope. You have to say, I need a 30 foot rope and I better get one in a hurry. I don't have time to look it up, see what I should do. Mm -hmm. And when I kind of relate this back to the phone, I mean, the phone is our own little mini computers that are sitting in our, in our, is, huh? uh, in our uh, pocket or on our yeah. hip side. Um, you know, it, it's got the maps on it. It's got the internet on it. It's got, everything that you could possibly need to, to get through the day, you know, it, you, all my books are on my phone, mm -hmm. you know, um, the one thing that I, I think is probably, I find it distracting from, from when I drive. Okay. Your phone um, it would be the map programs, you know, Google maps or Waze or whatever, <clears throat> um, you know, turn here, turn there. You know, I find myself not paying attention to my environment nearly as much as if I'm trying to find my, my way just by, you know, some written down directions or actually, you know, looking at a map. Sure. I think that, uh, um, especially with driving, I think that, uh, you know, those, those types of applications, while they're very helpful and I use them all the time to find out where I'm going, um, leads me never to be able to find that place back on my, on my own without that map uh, application. Uh, absolutely. And your uh, children, uh, I, I don't know their ages, but as they get older, they go, Dad, forget about the maps. I'm going to have a car come in and pick me up. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be driving. Oh. That's a form of art using artificial intelligence. It's going to tell me where to go. What you're losing is, uh, am I going north, south, east, or west? It's telling me, that's I told it where I'm going to go, and hopefully five 
plus six doesn't equal 30 when I get there. <laughs> um, just on a side note, I have a 30-year-old, a 20-year-old, a three-year-old, okay. and a six-month-old. Ah, there you go. They will be using those types all, of equipment. All by the same light. So just in case anybody's wondering, but um, yes. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've got multiple generations that, are raising, that I'm raising in my house. So it'll be interesting to see how this all works out. Um, ah, you get to watch them. And, yes. and uh, you have watched them develop. But what is learning? It is uh, what you hear and what you see. You encode it in your brain. You process it. You mentally process it. And then you uh, relate that into something usable sometime down the line. And so you extract that out. Where what is my concern with the generation, the spread of generation that you have, and you actually have two generations of, of children that are going to experience two different things uh, as they develop, that they are so reliant on technology that they can't process, uh, process the data and um, uh, th they're living on snippets is my concern. And so the longer you think about something, it took Einstein, I think, five, six years to develop his theory of relativity. relativity. And then in 1916, I think it was, he actually wrote it down and people thought he was a kook. Also, when he, when he uh, uh, refuted Isaac Newton's law of physics, but he, had, mm -hmm. he was thinking through that process a long, long term and then developed it into a firm theory. And it took us a hundred years to, to realize his theory of uh, uh, gravity, and in fact, was was true, and um, waves, uh, how waves change, and things like that. And you go, wow, this guy thought through it. It wasn't just a snippet that happened to pop in his head one day. Right. So, do you think our culture going forward is going to lose the great thinkers like that? We have a, a potential chance to, but uh, I am actually a, an optimist. I live as an optimist. I have lived my whole life that way, and that's what gave me the inventions and things like that, uh, allowed me to travel and be, uh, my wife and I, uh, successful. Uh, and so uh, I have full confidence that we are reverting to a system that actually parallels ancient ways that were, were successful. Uh, if you keep going down the track of delaying responsibility, you reach a point where some kids are released from college and all of a sudden they're responsible for their own debt and responsible for their own health care and responsible for mm -hmm. everything else. And they've never been trained for it. Where now uh, this pandemic has forced people to uh, work at home, just like they did in the past, make a living in their homestead, uh, teaching their children, the teacher and the children are picking up responsibilities that they have uh, probably didn't when they just put on their clothes and went to school. And so they're, they're, taking out the trash, they're, they're setting the table, they're seeing mom and dad working their butts off while they're playing or supposed to do schoolwork, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is putting them back into an ancient culture that we've done for thousands of years. The side effect of this is also, I think parents have, green, have uh, gained a uh, greater respect for teachers. Absolutely, absolutely. They're, they're professionals in their career. Yes, they're professionals. They're just learning to teach a different way. And they certainly found out the last six months how to teach a different way. <laughs> they're great at it. They're great at it. And that's what's beautiful about the system. You take talented people, talented people will figure out the best way to do things. That's true. I, I know a few, uh, a few other authors that uh, are switching to homeschooling now. Okay. Because they really enjoyed teaching their kids. And I know on the opposite side, a few other authors are like, I cannot wait until the school year starts, you know? <clears throat> yeah. I've got one uh, guy that says, I can't believe I raised such a jerk. Uh, I need to send him back to school so they can deal with them. But <clears throat> yeah. And, and uh, everybody has their, their own issues. And yes. That, that jerk is also the most phenomenal son on some days. It's just uh, uh, as, as a teacher told me, uh, and I, I claim that uh, the school system is really not no longer based on uh, primary goal of educating, it's to socialize. And you, you, uh, we're taking and busing our children to school for, for socialization. And as this teacher told me, 
uh, she was a middle school teacher. She said, it, it's uh, number one priority is socialization. Two is uh, fad, three is puberty and education is way down here someplace. Mm -hmm. And so that of course she's referring to uh, uh, middle schoolers, but it, it has some fundamental truths to it that uh, there are more efficient ways and we're figuring out more efficient ways. And a lot of those are actually uh, working with our son in the garage, uh, working with our daughter in the kitchen, working with our, our uh, taking our daughter on a hike out into the woods and observing, you know, the, the flowers or the sounds of the insects or whatever it is. We have more time. We're, we're at home. We're doing things like we used to do relating to ancient than we, than we have the past 20, 30 years. Just to uh, <clears throat> make one point about the jerk kid, just to go back to that, um, my prediction for him is that he's going to be a stand-up comic and very good. That <laughs> he, could be. he could be. And the more background he has and the, and the, the, the more uh, he's frustrated with his father, his frustra uh, father frustrated or mother frustrated with him, the, the more he's learned from it and the more humorous it will be because he can relate to actual incidents. And that's the most uh, best type of humor is when your audience can relate to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. When you look at the best comics that, uh, that you enjoy watching, that's exactly what they do is they take society or whatever's happening now and they relate it back to you. And then they portray it in just a little bit different way where it either punches up or punches down. And you know, it's, it's funny. I mean, we do the same thing when we uh, write, um, you know, when you're trying to incorporate humor into your writing, yeah. that, you know, you're really trying to either, you know, hit sarcasm or hit something in a, yep. in a quirky moment or, yep. you know, say something that's like, you know, throws a reader back, you know, it's, oh my gosh, that's, you know, it gets a little chuckle, you know. Well, in my, my book, uh, uh, I actually I use humor in all my books, uh, yeah. except my research projects. And, and though it's, it's really hard to get uh, humor in a patent or a research project, but uh, you realize what you just uh, fell into, and that is that uh, you're relying on memory. It is not artificial memory that's providing you that background in those stories. It's that son that is remembering things from the past. It is not looking it up on his cell phone. He may, he may, uh, like most of us now, have to use the cell phone to dial his friend, to dial his folks, because it's, it's automated. But it's the things that he remembers that he can actually relate to somebody else because it's actually ingrained and he pulls that up and uses that story from his past memory. It's, um, you know, it's, it's just not punching a calculator and or punching in uh, something on your phone and doing a quick uh, web search. <laughs> Those phones. I, I was just thinking back to a story that I was telling somebody that's much younger than me about uh, the uh, party line. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> to where somebody would pick up and yeah. say, you know, can I, you know, I mean, everybody's on one house, one line, yeah. everybody can jump on your mom and dad would jump on and say, it's time to get off the phone and go to bed, you know, or something like that. And that no longer exists. Everybody has their own phone line now. Yeah. And, and in fact, uh, when uh, you probably certainly when I started college, uh, we shared dorm rooms mm -hmm. and, um, uh, uh uh, we had we could have four to a room, and fortunately, I only there was only two of us in in our room, very small room, and the bathroom was down the hall. Well, uh, colleges have migrated because families have migrated more to one and and two children homes, meaning they got their own bathroom, they got their own bedroom. They weren't used to living in a close environment in uh, you know with three other people in their in their bedroom, and so right. this is a it's a uh, learning thing and our schools, for example, have had to adapt their residencies to uh, accommodate those, uh, uh, th this changing social system. And the memory system has done the same thing. I claim, as, as I, they said on that uh, uh, ramifications of artificial intelligence on my website mm -hmm. relating to ancients.com, that you have to remember in order to, 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 to uh, uh, progress. And uh, the more, if you don't remember, you're not learning because you can't translate that punch in a button. You can't translate that to something relevant to a, to a patent or whatever you're doing. You have to actually learn it. 
and I think it's really hard for to to conceive that a computer can learn the same way that a human can. It's you possible. Know, it's it, it's possible that it can mimic. Yes, it can mimic, but there's that certain part um, where, like publishing a book. There's no rational reason why you should do this. You just know in your heart that you can. There is no heart. You did it. You did it numerous times. Yes. You know, um, when you're, you know what? I'm going to ride my bike from pier to the North Pole. (laughs) And AI would say, uh, not a good idea, dude. What is uh, artificial intelligence based on? You're an IIT guy. It is based on standardization. What is the school system? It's standardization. What makes it function like it functions? It's standardization. Standardization is not innovative. Exactly. So the more we rely on AI and this in this recorded record and people being able to Google whatever they want, um, do you think that's going to stifle innovation? I think that uh, what we've seen is we transition out of standardized systems we're going to use technology to our benefit, but we're going to experience things in a different way, more like we did in ancient times. Keep in mind, they did not have electronics until uh, Thomas Edison, who died in my father's lifetime, Mm -hmm. okay? Uh, They started writing things down because they couldn't remember how many uh, uh, barrels of barley, baskets uh, of barley that uh, they sold to the Persians. And so they started making these little clay stamps. And that was the first forms of writing. Before that, the world developed on uh, strictly memory. There, I claim there were schools of memory all around the world. And those schools of memory uh, taught people how to uh, uh, design pyramids, how to measure, how to project elevations. That is phenomenal the way the Romans 2,500 years ago flowed water through aqueducts from mountains to cities at 3,000 foot, 2,000 foot drop in elevation. Right. They couldn't, they couldn't drain it, uh, drop it too fast. They had to know the elevation of where it had to go. They couldn't uh, take it too low and bring it back up because they didn't use pumps. It was, uh, they built bridges, aqueducts to transition that. The same way with the Egyptian pyramids a thousand years earlier. We don't have the sketches. We don't know how they measured but they certainly did. They had extremely accurate measurements. They memorized it. They knew I, how to function with basic tools. I think it's funny that, you know, you bring up the pyramids. Those are, those have always been, well, how did they do it? You know, and they, and you can see on just about any, I mean, any site you go to on that subject, you know, they, they all kind of theorize how, how it was actually built and how they did it. And there's all sorts of, you know, how they cut the stones, how they actually got them from one place to another. Was it, you know, a million slaves? Was it some other, you know, I mean, all the way up to uh, aliens transport. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, you know, yeah. I mean, there's some wild there, theories. There are some wild theories. But well, we can look at the pyramids and they're there. They're there. Absolutely. And they're not only there in, in Egypt, they're in uh, uh, Central America. They're all over the world. People don't realize that pyramids during that era are all over the world. Absolutely. You go to Guatemala, and they didn't even discover them until the 20th century. Mm-hmm. I I uh, have watched a couple documentaries. Just South America in general is loaded with them, mm-hmm. and they keep on finding them with their you know the radar and the in the schematical scans of the, sure. of the landscape. It's like, oh, there's another one. They're able to look through a canopy to discover these, and yeah. some were discovered by accident uh, again during the 20th century. And uh, we've been to Guatemala, and we go to some of these pyramids, and it's phenomenal. Uh, were there enough people to build it? <laughs> yeah, they obviously were. Had they, had, they, had they developed a system where they could feed and shelter their people without the labor that they needed to build the pyramids? Yeah. Did it take them all? Sure. But they did it. They built pyramid after pyramid. They moved unbelievably huge rocks, not only in Egypt, but other places around the world. They had the technology to do it, and they learned it. And I think that's the most amazing thing that we found out in the last, what, probably 50 years or whatever, um, as, as these places have been discovered more recently than, than that, is that technology that historically you look at that you thought was purely Egyptian technology was actually spread throughout the entire world. Right. 
Why? Memory. It had to be. It wasn't written. But that that technology had to go from one place to another. Right. People people moved. It, this this thought that uh, and and some people think that you know it it, it took a hundred years to move one person to uh, uh, you know the the next environment. Uh, we know we know that uh, uh, there's a book called uh, House of Rain. It was it's a travelogue. I don't know if you've read that. The guy lives in Colorado and he's hiked a lot of the uh, the ancient sites, ancient native sites in uh, the Four Corners area, Colorado, Utah, yep. uh, Arizona, and documented that down into Mexico. And what he what people have discovered, not only in that book, but he, he pointed out in that book that that they were using birds out of out of uh, Puerto Rico or uh, not Puerto Rico, uh, um, not Puerto Rico. Yeah, Puerto Rico and uh, Latin America, uh, El, uh, San Salvador, El Salvador, and bringing birds out of uh, uh, Central America up into a dry environment. And what they also realized, the birds were dying. They used it for ceremonial purposes. The birds were dying. They figured out, oh, they need vitamin D. They need sunlight, the natural vitamin D. And so they built cages so that the birds could get vitamin D. And so they had and reproduced birds in that environment, but they transported them for thousands of miles. Right. Now I biked in 40 days from Pierce, South Dakota, 3000 miles up to North Pole, Alaska. Like you say, it's not logical, but I did it. Grim. You think that people back in that day uh, without bicycles could move a hundred miles in a couple of days? Without a doubt, without a doubt. They were a hell of a lot better shape than this 65 year old guy. <laughs> I, I think that's one thing to note is that, uh, you know, I, I was listening to somebody else talking about how each generation thinks the next generation is so out of shape. And, you know, the, you know, like my grandfather, you know, probably thought my dad was like, oh my gosh, you know, really? <clears throat> you should probably, you know, go out to the park, or go out to the lot and work a little bit more or something like that or whatever. Um, you know, the generation before that's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe how weak you know, there's, there's news articles going back to as far as the 1800s complaining about how weak the next generation is and how they'll never be able to defend the country. They'll no, never be able to do this or that, you know, and we've right. done pretty good at uh, defending ourselves and, and stepping up when we need to. But I think that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, concept that, you know, historically, our ancestors were probably in much better shape than we are just because of the environment they had to live in. Yes, physically, but also their lifespan was less. That's true. What has extended lifespan has been uh, our ability to use technology and develop technology with innovation. And so as I developed the books, Culture and the Mysterious Agent Changing It, you have to rely on innovation, whether it be electronic, whether it be mechanical, and you referenced the 1800s. It was a mechanical revolution that probably generated those thoughts in those books because they say, I used to do that by hand and now you're doing it with a machine. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you what, that little uh, 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 combine out there that threshes grain, yes, it may not take as much uh, physical labor, but it's certainly more efficient. What you used to do, Father, uh, in 1860, I in 1885 can do twice as much with this machine. I, I remember digging post holes when I was a kid with a hand digger. Yep. <clears throat> you know, putting up corrals, doing whatever, you know, you know, picking it up and, oh, yeah. and throwing yep. it out. I've done it. We've done it. I, <clears throat> yep. As I, I mentioned, it. I raised, we raised cattle and we dug and uh, dug pencil, fence post holes. And I remember when we got our first auger that mounted on the back of the tractor and dug holes for us. That's what I was going to say is that uh, I was really uh, uh, disappointed with two things. Uh, number one, when I went to college, my dad got rid of the square baler and went to round bales that he could pick up with the tractor. Yeah. And the second one was the postal digger. Yeah, Tech using technology to make it more efficient. Did you put in more post holes? Probably a few more, but you went on to the next job. That's where you use technology to uh, don't waste a lot of extra time digging post holes. You use your time doing other things. Plus he lost his labor. 
that uh, uh, always generates change, doesn't it? It, it uh, created some innovation on the farm. It, it did. We, uh, uh, as a, uh, I had, uh, there were six of us boys, so I have five younger mm -hmm. brothers. And so when we were old enough to pitch bales, uh, dad and I used to stack by hand. I, I eventually, at seven years old, uh, run the tractor and would put hay up on the stack and, and he would stack it. Well, when I got a little bit older and my brothers got a little bit older, uh, we got, uh, he bought a square baler. Well, if I can square bale, then we get more milk cows. And so because we got more milk cows, it'll keep you boys busy. Mm -hmm. And he did. <laughs> and those are the types of things that you look at when you see the changes in culture and and uh, just the way society is. And, and, you know, even though, you know, things are getting more efficient and everything, I, I can't imagine trading, throwing square bales from, uh, you know, from the uh, baler to the trailer and then, and, uh, and from the trailer into the, into the uh, hayloft. I, I can't imagine not doing that as a kid. That was, you know, even though it was horrible, dusty, you know, I mean, it was just dirty work. Um, it was probably the best gym workout I've ever had. Certainly, as a, as a wrestler, you uh, you can uh, uh, appreciate the, the different muscles that it that it made. Uh, fortunately, my father found a, uh, a conveyor that uh, we couldn't, as, as young boys, couldn't throw bales into the hayloft. So what he did, he found this old conveyor run on PTO, and it would we had to take it from the back of the trailer, the bale, throw it on the conveyor, which would convey up to the hayloft, and then one of us would be in the hayloft stacking. Mm -hmm. So we used technology even back in that day, mechanical, but it worked. Nevertheless, it's technology. It is. So just kind of shifting gears real quick, um, you have your website relating uh, to agents.com. Yes. You have your three books, um, the, uh, the wonderful adventure that you had to the North Pole. Destination and, North Pole, 5,000 kilometers by bicycle. Yes. There you go. And you have relating to agent culture and, and the mysterious agent changing it. Yeah. Um, just to kind of summarize. Where and learning as it influences the 21st century. That one's yeah. a key one. Yeah. <clears throat> so just to kind of summarize, where are you going with this in the future? I mean, how many more books are you going to be putting out on the relating to ancient series? I have some other ones started and... Uh, I have some other uh, writing projects that I'm working on. So whether they fit into that series or not, I, I'm, I'm not at this point willing to say whether it's going to be two or three uh, more books, but there will be books like Destination North Pole that do not fit into the relating to ancient series, but are fun and humorous books and enjoyable to read just like those other two. Okay. That sounds good. I uh, I noticed the uh, time and uh, was just thinking that it was probably time to wrap it up. Is there anything that uh, you would like to tell your readers or any of your fans at this point? Look for fun books to read. This is a cultural uh, tri time of transition. We're, uh, as we talked about, have to uh, be at home when we don't necessarily want to. We have to avoid meeting people that we want to meet, uh, uh, unfortunately not uh, like we had in the past. But this is an exciting, absolutely exciting time because the children are learning things like hygiene that they wouldn't have learned <laughs> had we not experienced this. These are very critical times and children will look back at this period and go, wow, I'm glad I lived through that because I learned things that I wouldn't have learned had I not been uh, uh, living through that transition. And so that is what I discuss as we change from ancient ways to modern ways. We see how learning has transitioned and will transition for the rest of the 21st century. We've learned how culture, we look at the past, we observe the present, and we project out the future. And that is what I do in the book. And that's what makes the books uh, exciting. I start in Pierce, South Dakota, and I end up in North Pole, Alaska, you know, near the Arctic Circle. It's, you take it to a different place. That was an incredible journey, and I really appreciate uh, your documentation and your take on that uh, that entire trip, Gary. It's been it's been just a pleasure to get to know you. 
I, I, I really appreciate everything that you're doing with your, with your writing. It's, it, it's Thank special you. and it's, it's something that's needed by society today. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just, uh, I, I'm very impressed. I, I, you know, when I started researching into your background and everything else, I'm very impressed with you. Well, uh, thank you. And I, I appreciate uh, ho hosting you today. We've, we've had an interesting discussion and I hope some of the things that we've talked about make people think. And so on my books, if there's a page that doesn't make you think, then I have failed my job as a writer. And if you write your mystery books and you fail to bring the reader along uh, you won't be satisfied on that page. And so that's why you keep correcting and modifying. And so I want people to go to relatingtoancients.com or, or uh, you know, Amazon and order my books or bookch.com and, and order them there. But you have to be willing to be open to new ideas. Do I follow a genre of, of, of uh, writing? No, I write because I want to and something that I think is interesting to your readers uh, to readers. And I think that's the way you have written to your, your books. It, I, I find them intriguing and I look forward to reading. Well, hopefully you're not disappointed, but uh, <laughs> let me know. Let me know. All right. So if you want to care, if you want to follow uh, uh, Gary Whitgriff, um, again, you can go to www.relatingtoancients.com. You can find them on Amazon. You can actually find his books all over the place. Just go to Google and uh, and uh, search his name. I will post all the uh, links on oh, the, uh, both the podcast and the YouTube. Um, and with that, this is Jeff Bacon with the DIY Writer Podcast. I want to thank you for listening. And if you don't mind, please subscribe to my channel. Bye. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs>